So this is part two of the Rupsalis Rarity Classification Series. And part one, if you haven't seen it, I highly suggest you go watch that one first. Otherwise, some of the things that I say in this video might not make that much sense. Next up, we have Rupsalis heliabiana. That is a tough one to say. So this used to be classified as Rupsalis bassifera subspecies heliabiana. However, it, it was moved to its own species. So what that tells us really is that it bears strong resemblance to a Ripsalis bassifera, uh, both in plant form probably and in flower form. My dog is investigating. <laughs> so the plant we have in front of us is not necessarily, this is not necessarily Ripsalis helibi helibiana. The reason why I put this plant up here is because it would bear a strong resemblance to this. And the reason why I'm doing it isn't to try to create confusion, it's to try to create clarity around what this plant might actually look like. So the difference there being is that this plant is supposed to have white flowers. Uh, so the plant is supposed to bear a very strong resemblance to Ripsalis terrace. And I believe we're talking about the standard form of terrace. And so the standard form of terrace is a little interesting, but it's supposed to bear a strong resemblance to that, which this plant does. This is an unclassified species, by the way. So it, it's just going to look something kind of like this, which makes this really difficult. So unfortunately, in terms of rarity for this plant, you know, again, it falls into the same kind of category. Like, how can you classify something that you can't even figure out what it is? And that makes it a little bit more rare just because you can't figure out what it is. You know, So I think for this one, we're going to have to go with rare. I think it's out there. I think people probably have it. I think that people probably have it and are calling it Ripsalis bassifera. I think they might be calling it Ripsalis terrace. I think they might be calling it a lot of things, but the long story short is that I think that people probably have it and don't know that they have it, and therefore the classification is rare. Next up, we have Ripsalis hollery. Now, Ripsalis hollery is a very popular Ripsalis. It's the kind of Ripsalis that everyone wants because it has that long, long, beautiful spaghetti growth habit. Now, the only thing that I ever really see this one real commonly confused with is going to be Ripsalis bassifera. Uh, a couple of the subspecies look similar to this one. Uh, there's something kind of distinct about this, generally, is that the branches are kind of a grayish green color, so that can sort of help identify that almost looks like they have powder on them sometimes. And there's something very strange about the way that the growth comes in, in terms of the joints. See how it, it kind of grows funny there. And this one doesn't, it can get very, very, very long. Like for example, here is a branch that is growing all the way from the base, all the way down there, and it has not stopped growing. So this is one where it doesn't necessarily terminate. It can just keep growing and growing and growing. Doesn't really have much of a set length there. And the only reason why some of these are growing like this is because the tips of these got damaged and they stopped being able to grow from that point. So they started growing from other points. Here's one that decided to do something very strange. This one just decided that it was going to do that. So, you know, kind of different unique it's very unique in terms of it's a rupsalis that has a very pigmented flower so the flowers are kind of this like reddish sort of purplish color and that's just so uncommon in rupsalis so this one really takes the cake in a lot of ways in terms of rarity it has become more available in the United States. It's become more available in the United States simply because there was one distributor or, you know, one sort of nursery that started selling it. And sometimes that's all it takes is one nursery, you know, and it became more available. So in the United States, I think that we have to go with between rare and uncommon 
There's a problem with this, which I think that you can go on Etsy, eBay, or Horticult LLC, and you can generally get this plant in the United States. So in the United States, like I said, it's a little more available, so we can't totally go with the rare on the classification in this one. I do think that this is incredibly rare in other countries, though. Next up, we have Rupsalis jungeri, and as you can see, there is nothing on the table here. So I can describe this one a little bit because I had this plant for two seconds. I had a cutting of this plant for two seconds before it died. It was already mostly dead by the time that I got it. So a couple of things that I know that I can say about this plant. One is that I have read that it is very hard to grow, this Rupsalis, which might be the reason why it's not more widely cultivated. Two is that from my experience, and granted it was just the one cutting, it obviously did not ship very well. Uh, it was falling apart and just barely even alive by the time that I got it. And Rupsalis are usually really resilient, but this one just, it just kind of immediately died. Like I said, it was already mostly dead. One of the things that I can say is that it, it has some resemblance to some of the sort of like segmented, pendented sort of plant. So it, it has some resemblance to like your Clavata deliculata, some Campos potoana, Bercellii, uh, Ormondoi. So it, it bears some resemblance to those plants, but it has very prominent red scales at the aerials. So, and it's, it's one of the few plants that looks a little Clavata-ish. And, you know, we kind of say that a lot, like whenever somebody comes up with a clavada uh, and they're like, oh, what is this? Well, I mean, <laughs> like we can almost always tell that it's clavada because of the way that clavada's little terminal ends are. And granted, I don't I think it would be hard to confuse clavada and jungari for each other just because jungari has those red scales. So but it does have some resemblance to clavada. In terms of rarity, I think given everything that I just said about it, I think that this one is going to fall between your firstborn child and rare. I literally only know of one private collection in the United States where it's in, but I'm guessing there's a handful more. Uh, so I think it's one that you're pretty much, you can't import it from any nursery that I know of outside of the United States, like your Cactean Hage or your Uleg Cactean, you can't import it. So very, very, very hard to get. Next up, we have Rupsalis Lindbergiana. And this one here, oh, this is complicated. It, it's such a cool plant. It gets these really, really long, long, long branches. So it's the kind of ones where you see those gorgeous pictures in the wild, where you see like the big, long, long, like super long, like trailing Rupsalis that is just in these big, giant, like hunks of plant. I mean, it's the kind that if you're going to take a picture of a Rupsalis in the wild and put it on the cover of a magazine, it's going to be Rupsalis Lindbergiana. <sighs> Unfortunately, this guy is... He's kind of the subject of getting confused with his naming. Are those new branches coming out or are those like weird little aerial roots? This plant's doing something funny. I think those are aerial roots. So I do think this one is also, you can see the little aerial roots, one that is subject to getting aerial roots. Um, the problem here is, is that, you know, once again, I think that there was a nursery that helped create a lot of confusion by accidentally deciding that Ripsalis grandiflora was Ripsalis lindbergiana. And unfortunately, it, it's kind of messed up in the U.S. now in terms of identification. So you can definitely tell that it's Ripsalis lindbergiana, like I said, because it, it doesn't really stop growing. So it doesn't have like a segment and then stop growing, whereas Ripsalis grandiflora definitely does. It definitely doesn't just keep getting longer and longer. But you can see just how long this piece is. And when you look at those pictures of it growing in the wild, I mean, they are just really long and it's incredible. It's incredibly beautiful. Added to that, the flowers on this one, 
they they flower all along the branches here, but the flowers kind of resemble a little bit more of like Ripsalis teres heterocleta type flowers. So they have more of that shape, whereas Ripsalis grandiflora has like these ginormous flowers. The flowers on this are smaller and they don't have as many petals and they don't really, like I said, they just kind of look a little Ripsalis teres heterocleta ish. So just a little bit different. So in terms of rarity on this one, I feel like because it got so confused with Rupsalis grandiflora in the United States, and the only way that I could get a confirmed, confirmed one was importing and, and importing, I think, from a very well-known, reputable sort of source. You know, I think that we have to go with rare on this one. Yeah, so we'll go with rare on this one. Next up, we have Rubsalis mesembryanthemoides. <laughs> Rubsalis mesembryanthemoides. Holy cats, that is a hard name to say. So in any case, yeah, this, this is really, really pretty common. This one is big box store common. Uh, that's the classification we get to give this one because this one is very, very commonly sold as those like little two inch succulents in the United States that you see because it fits nicely in those little clusters. They look nice. It's easily propagatable. You don't need a whole lot of the plant to propagate. It's easy to grow. Uh, I think that this one also comes from Brazil and you know, it's cool. I think that when I first got it, I was not all that into it. Uh, I think because it was just so common and I was so used to seeing it and stuff, it just kind of wasn't a real standout plant to me. But after a while, when I started watching it grow and stuff, and y you know, it's interesting. It's interesting and it's a very different kind of Ripsalis. So just because it's common doesn't mean that it's not super interesting. So yeah, definitely big box store common. Up next, we have Rupsalis macrantha form macrantha. Now, this is kind of interesting. It pretty much just has these like flat, flat segments. You can see there's really kind of not a lot to it. I feel like Rupsalis macrantha is kind of a crazy thing because I have quite a bit of Rupsalis macrantha and some of the Rupsalis macrantha that I have doesn't even really fit into the forms. And there's something that I've noticed about plants that have a lot of forms like that. Generally, we are given, or generally forms that are classified, like they are classified, meaning that they are frequent and recognizable. That doesn't necessarily mean that that is the only form that that plant can take. That's not necessarily what that means. It just means that it's recognizable, very clearly recognizable. So this one is very clearly recognizable as being the standard form of Macrantha. In terms of rarity, I don't think that this one is very hard to find. I do think it is commonly sold under a different name though. Um, so I feel like this one is really, really commonly sold under the name Ripsalis Tanduzi or Tanduzii. And that might be a little bit subject to my own opinion. <laughs> so yeah, because I feel like a long, long time ago, I, you know, I remember like a decade ago seeing nothing but this plant that looked just like this that was called Ripsalis tonduzi. And I remember wanting it real bad. I wanted it so badly because I thought it was so cool and I thought it had this just like super rad name, right? And so I remember that plant very, very well. Fast forward 10 years, you know, and collecting Ripsalis, I think what was very strange is that there was a lot of confusion about this plant. And when I went to go look up the description for Ripsalis tonduzi or tonduzii, I, just, I couldn't really find any mention of it having flat growth like this at all. So I think that there is a potential that somewhere along the way something just got confused and a big nursery, a big well-known nursery started distributing Ripsalis macrantha under the name Ripsalis tonduzi or tonduzii. And then, you know, here we have it. Like, 
years later, even I was confused because I was like, wait a second, how is that not time doozy? And I had to do tons of research before I finally just sat there like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> but yeah, so this plant is, Rup is Rupsalis macrantha for macrantha. And in terms of rarity, I'm definitely going to say that it is not, it's not super rare by any stretch of the imagination. We'll call this one common. It's not big box store common. And I don't really think it's uncommon. I think it might just be a little tough to get it under the right name, but this should be, I, I would say that it is common. Next up, we have Rupsalis macrantha form Kerbergii. Now, again, this is like a real questionable thing because we all know Rupsalis collectors, we all know that Rupsalis tanduzi was moved underneath Rupsalis macrantha form Kerbergii. And like I said, we, we all have this notion that Rupsalis tanduzi is a flat, it has flat clades, that it's two winged. We all have that assumption. And there may be a form of Rupsalis macrantha form Kerbergii that d does have flat segments. I'm not entirely positive about that. But what I do know is that the description for Rupsalis macrantha form Kerbergii listed as having more angles than that. So it definitely is one that is being listed as having four to six angled segments. And in other descriptions, I've seen it where it's been listed as having possibly three. So possibly three all the way up to a, a ginormous amount of segments. It's kind of crazy. So here we have two plants. This one I bought under a completely different name. And then this one I think I also bought as like some unknown or whatever. But on close inspection and really looking at it and comparing it to some of the other forms of Macrantha, it is very obviously Macrantha and it is very obviously form Kerbergii. So it, I, I have seen this very commonly being distributed under a very, very incorrect name recently. So I'm seeing this one come out of a known nursery where it's coming out with the name Rupsalis sulcata. That is definitely not a correct name. So if you have this plant and you're real confused and you're like, gosh, it looks something kind of like Rupsalis trigona or wait, maybe it looks like Rupsalis pentaptera, but why does it have like three and four angled segments? Like I'm so confused. You probably are sitting on Rupsalis macrantiform Kerbergii. And when it blooms, you can definitely tell what it is because it's got those classic little, the small little white macrantha flowers. And then it took a really long time for these berries to ripen, but they ripened to be kind of this transparent white with a little bit of like pinkish red right at the ends there. And you can see initially they're green. It's pretty floriferous, pretty cool plant. So in terms of rarity, we're going to go with uncommon for this one. And I think that this is very easy to find. I would say that it was common if it was actually being distributed under an appropriate name. So in order for you to get this plant and get it correctly, you have to know what it is, what it looks like, and what names it's commonly being missold as. So we have to call it uncommon for that reason, but it is genuinely common in the United States. Next up, we have Rupsalis macranthiform raiorum. So this is the one that I am most accustomed to seeing. It, the growth on this, I think, is a little bit atypical. Uh, I have actually seen it be considerably shorter and more like this. See how you get like the lobes? It's thick. It's very thick and sturdy, and it is also very subject to corking. I used to have a great big, huge one of these. It was literally a pain in my butt. <laughs> it was such a pain. It was so big. It was so cumbersome. So that should tell you something about this plant. It grows very easily. I would put this one somewhere between big box store common and common. This is the one that I see the most often. It's the most recognizable. It is more commonly sold as Rupsalis macrantha. Granted, a lot of times the subspecies is dropped off, but you can at least still find it under the correct name. It's not commonly mislabeled. I think it would be very hard to mislabel this one. So, yeah, this one definitely classified as 
big box store common to common because I have seen it sold in big box stores in the US before. Next up, we have Ripsalis Nevis Armandii Form Nevis Armandii. Now, this one is both epiphytic and epilithic. And interestingly enough, there are two flower types here. I don't want to say types really. It's, it's more like there are different clones and one of the clones has kind of like that pinky orange stamen, you know, center to the flower. And the other one has a yellow center to the flower. And unfortunately, <laughs> once again, you know, there is some very well-known nurseries that I think that because the flower center has been yellow they didn't think that it was Nevis or Mondii, and in the United States, they determined them to be something else. Uh, sometimes they have been commonly confused and named Rupsalis grandiflora, and other times I've seen them commonly confused and named uh, different, different subspecies of Rupsalis fulcosa. But both of the plants that we have in front of us, they are in fact Rupsalis Nevis or Mondii. The left one I've had for a little bit longer. It never grows, but it blooms like mad. <laughs> I think I may need to put it in a little bit more shade because I put it in quite a bit of light and it, it just blooms and blooms and blooms. And you can see that one of the things about this plant that's interesting is that it has the these like spots on it. So it has darkening where the aerials are. And that can cause this plant to commonly be confused for other plants as well. See the darkening at the aerials. So a lot of times it might just get kind of like confused, especially in pictures or whatever for uh, Ripsalis punicio discus. And then the other one that's over here, you can see the spots are even more prominent on this one. And these are cuttings. And so like this one is just rooting and it doesn't have quite the same level of like psycho scarring as this other one does and that's it'll get like crazy psycho scarring like this because the blooms develop underneath the aerials are actually buried they're hidden and they start to develop there and then they pop out and then they leave this giant crater scar and the difference between these is is that this clone is the one that has that like pinkish orangish sort of center of the flower this clone is the one that has the yellowish sort of center so in terms of a rarity, considering that I had to import one of these and that the other one I bought under an incorrect name, and I've never really seen this sold in the United States, I think we would have to call this one rare. It's definitely not one where you, you know, have to like give up your firstborn child for it, but it is definitely rare in the United States. And I've, I've just never seen it, not on eBay, not on Etsy, never really seen it sold in any sort of like Facebook front. So I think it's one that if you want it, your best bet is, you know, really an in search of because I think you're really going to need to get it from a private collector. And next up is Rupsalis Nevis Armandii form Megalantha. So this is pretty interesting because... Here again, we have two different clones and same thing you can on this one, you can have a clone that has the orangish pinkish center, or you can have a clone that has the yellowish center. The orangish pinkish one is the more commonly recognized one. It has the largest flower of all of the Ripsalis flower. The flower on this is huge. There is no way that this plant should ever really be mistaken for any other plant. It unfortunately is quite often though, quite often is mistaken for Ripsalis grandiflora or different forms of Ripsalis flocosa. So the reason why we have these two clones here is I, I pulled them out because of the difference in their growth habit. This one came, I believe from Cactine Hage and that one was imported from a different nursery in Germany. And there are very clearly both you can definitely tell in the growth, they are very clearly both Ripsalis nevis armandii form megalantha. You can see the giant craters that the flowers left here. I mean, look at those giant craters. Those are just massive. But you see sort of this difference in the growth here. Like it can get this kind of like furry caterpillary growth. This one's more pendant. 
you know, you can kind of see that. And just because the form on the plant is just a little bit different doesn't mean that it's a completely different plant, right? So this will, as time goes on, get heavier and heavier and more pendant. And just because you see a little bits of this caterpillary growth on the plant doesn't mean it's a different plant. So in terms of rarity, I feel like this plant is never sold under its name. Uh, <laughs> and because of that, I think we're going to go with uncommon. I don't think we're going to go with rare on this one. Even though I never really seen it, see it sold under its name, I know that you can get it from nurseries. I know there are places that you can get it from. I think that it's just a matter of being able to recognize it. And I think because the plant is so recognizable that I think if you really wanted it, it wouldn't be that hard to get it. So I think we're going to have to go with Uncommon for this one. And next up, we have Ripsalis oblonga. Now this is really confusing to me. So apparently there was this plant that was known as Rupsalis crispimarginata, and it was highly recognizable. And the reason why it was so recognizable is because its, its clades did this, this like wildly like wavy, weird sort of appearance that these clades have. So it's very, very, very easy to recognize. Very, very lobed, very easy to recognize. It, it was apparently reduced underneath Ripsalis oblonga. And then that made me really, really confused because if this is Ripsalis oblonga, what the heck is this plant? Is it supposed to also be Ripsalis oblonga? And it's just not the like super curly form and it just happens to grow like a completely different sort of color. I mean, I can see some of the resemblance, but are they really the same plant? Like, is this really the same plant? Is it? Is it? I don't know if this is the same plant. Not exactly sure what's going on there. And I feel like I eventually will kind of figure out what is going on there. I think it's going to take a lot of research and stuff. There, I don't quite know what this plant is anymore. I'm really confused. But more commonly, when I purchase Ripsalis oblonga, I get this plant. Sometimes I can get it under the name Ripsalis oblonga. Like when I imported it from Cactine Hage, it came, this one came under the name Ripsalis oblonga. So given that, and, and given that I'm not totally sure if that plant is Ripsalis oblonga, but I do know that they moved this one underneath Ripsalis oblonga. I'm so confused about it that I don't totally know what is what anymore. So given that I don't even know what is Ripsalis oblonga, I don't know how to classify this because you can get this plant and you can get that plant and you can get them fairly easily. I think that it's hit or miss that if I went to go get this plant as Ripsalis oblonga, I think... It's hit or miss as to whether I would get Ripsalis oblonga, but more often than not, I would probably get that plant. Every once in a while, I might get this plant, but I might also get a completely wrong plant. So because of that, I think we're going to go with Uncommon. You know, I it's not a big box store kind of plant. Definitely not. You know, I think that if I was to go purchase this from, like, five different sellers, two out of the five, I would probably get that plant. Uh, I, I don't think I would get this one. I think I would get this one under the name Ripsalis crispin marginata still. So, and the crispin marginata, like if I went to go look for that, I would definitely get crispin marginata. It would be really, really rare that I would get something else. Closest thing that I might get is maybe like Ripsalis crispata. So, yeah, I think we're going to have to classify this one as uncommon and someday hopefully figure out what the heck is going on with Ripsalis oblonga. So next up we have Ripsalis occidentalis. Now, full transparency, I don't know if this is Ripsalis occidentalis. It could be or it could just be another uh, Ripsalis gobeliana. Uh, I feel like this one is extremely hard to identify and part of the reasoning why I think this is extremely difficult to identify is because it bears some resemblance, especially in juvenile form, it is apparently almost indiscernible 
from Rupsalis, um, from Rupsalis Gobeliana. Uh, noting that one of the only really big differences between the two is going to be their color. It is also apparently quite similar to Rupsalis oblonga. So when that happens and you get like this cluster of them where they're, they're kind of similar, what I find is that the name gets sort of changed around and they get misidentified and they start getting sold under, you know, different names and, and that kind of thing. I actually think that I pulled this in. I believe I imported this from another country and I did not import it under that name. I imported this under the name. I think it was like Ripsalis platycarpa. So the thing that was interesting to me, though, was the plant. I definitely did not have a Ripsalis that looked anything like this. So pulling back Ripsalis gobeliana again, uh, you know, here you can see the marked difference in the coloration between these two, which is the only reason why I think there is a possibility that this one might maybe be Ripsalis occidentalis. Uh, whatever the case is, though, Ripsalis occidentalis, in the wild, it can get quite large, so it can definitely compete with your, like, Ripsalis pachypteras, but in cultivation, it has a tendency to remain fairly small, about half the size as normal, so it's generally going to be a smaller kind of plant. In terms of the rarity classification on this one, if I was to go search for this on eBay, Etsy, I wouldn't find anything. Uh, if I was to look for it on Google, I might find some pictures of it. Some of those pictures might be questionable. If I was to go on Facebook and start doing some searching, I would find some pictures, but the only pictures I would find would be coming out of um, reputable sort of private collections. So for the rarities on this one, I think we're gonna go uh, somewhere between rare and your firstborn child, but we're gonna go much, much closer to the rare side. So I know that you can get it in the United States. I know that it's available. Like I know that I've seen pictures of it. So I know that it's in private collections and it you can get it versus some of the other plants where that is just not the case. There's so few private collections that would be kind of impossible. At least you can find pictures of this one. Oh boy, you see that the table is empty again, but not because we can't identify it. I think it's because this is like, this is a Rupsalis that most people have never even heard of. This is so mythical. This Rupsalis is just like, I feel like the rarity classification on this one has to be your firstborn child's firstborn child kind of thing. It's that rare. So this would be Rupsalis olivera. I have seen one picture in my whole entire life and of all of the internet searching that I have done, one picture ever of this Ripsalis. Now, this is a flat cladded Ripsalis. So again, it's one of those big kind of flat clades, it's kind of round or ovular clades. Now, some years ago, there was a lady who gave me some cuttings of a plant and you know, she kept telling me that it was like the super rare one. She was like, the flowers are purple. And it was really funny because I kept correcting her. And I was like, you mean the berries are purple? And she was like, no, the flowers are purple. And I'm like, you mean the berries? And there was a little bit of a language barrier there. You know, my first language is English. I think that her first language was uh, Thai. And so there, there was some confusion that was going on there. And I would be shocked if the cuttings that I got from this lady turned out to actually be Ripsalis olivifera. And I would, I would feel very bad that I kept continuously correcting her because at the time of all the Ripsalis in all of the lands, I never ever thought that there was a Ripsalis out there with flat clades that didn't have whitish, greenish or yellowish flowers. Now, Technically, the flowers on this, they are kind of a whitish and they are tinged with kind of a pinkish color. So it is a very remarkable, very beautiful sort of Ripsalis. It's one that's just not out there. And, um, you know, this plant that I have that has never bloomed, I can show the plant. It's kind of a weird plant. 
And please don't think that this is the correct plant because quite frankly, I will never know until this plant blooms. It's very, very stiff. It's very large. It's very prone to corking. Like it's got pretty big clades. That's one thing about Ripsalis olivifera that I can say is that it has large clades. So it doesn't have small clades like some of the other ones do. The clades on this are so stiff, they are just legitimately not even really all that bendable. They are stiff, stiff, and it has really prominent ribs. So in all of my collection, I don't have another Ripsalis like this. So unfortunately, it's just never bloomed. I mean, I've had it. It's one of my oldest Ripsalis. Uh, I think she gave it to me when I very first started getting into Ripsalis. It's never bloomed. So hopefully someday it blooms, and hopefully someday I figure out what it is. If it's Ripsalis olivifera, I will be super shocked. But just know that out there, there really is this crazy mythical Ripsalis that has those flat clades like that, that has whitish sort of pinkish flowers. So yeah, in terms of rarity, like I said, we're gonna classify that one. Your firstborn child, firstborn child. <laughs> Next up, we have Ripsalis ormondoi. Now, this one, you know, obviously it kind of resembles your Campos Potuana or your Bertelli. It is a little bit different in terms of, I would say that its clades are kind of fat and chubby. They do bear some resemblance to Clavada. And so once again, we fall into this really weird thing where like a lot of times we'll say, you know, like only Clavada has those flared segments, you know, uh, they just have that flare at the end of their segments, which isn't entirely true because... Ripsalis ormondoi has that too. It has a different growth pattern though, but generally you're so unlikely to come across this plant that we're not really going to identify it as that or even make the guess that it might be that plant. So one of the things about this is that whenever uh, it goes to bloom, the outer petals on this uh, and the ovary, I believe, the outside of it, there's sort of a deep pinkish color. So that's what makes this one really cool. It has very similar flowers to Ripsalis jungari, to Ripsalis campos portoana, to Ripsalis burchelli. They all have very, very similar flowers. The only difference is, like I said, this guy has that little bit of pink on the outside. And you can see what I'm talking about, about the you know, the growth, it kind of flares out like that. So you can see this, this slight resemblance to Clavada, but a somewhat different growth pattern here. And you can see this is just like one tiny little rooted cutting. So that should give you an idea about its rarity. In terms of its rarity classification, uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna have to go with between rare and your firstborn child. <laughs> I don't want to say your firstborn child, but like, I kind of feel like that's partially true. So you can't really import it. You can't really get it from any of the nurseries, you know, like in European nurse nurseries, you'd only find it in a very, very few collections. I think in the United States, private collections. Um, yeah, I think it's one of those things where you, you pretty much like have to have a friend of a friend kind of thing. So its classification is going to stand somewhere between rare and your firstborn child. Here we have Ripsalis Pacheco leonis subspecies Pacheco leonis. So yeah, this one here, I feel like unfortunately, again, the exact same thing happened to this one that has happened to a few other ones. There were some generally kind of fairly well-known or reputable nurseries took Ripsalis Pacheco leonis subspecies catalinulata that had like a slightly different form, like a little bit of a different clone. They threw the name Pacheco leonis on it, dropped the subspecies, and unfortunately everyone now thinks that that is the subspecies Pacheco leonis. <sighs> I had to import this. <laughs> This is kind of a mess because I think that there is a plant that is in the United States that is commonly being sold under the name Ripsalis dismillis by more than one nursery. And I think that that plant is Ripsalis pacheco leonis, subspecies pacheco leonis. I want to talk a little bit about 
how things can get confused historically, how the IDs of some plants can get confused. Because it's not always just a shop, you know, like some sometimes it's like, well, how did they get that information? Where did they get that information from? So in terms of Rupsalis Pacheco leonis, subspecies Pacheco leonis, being so commonly confused for Rupsalis dismilis, what happened with this plant is that way, way, way back in the day, uh, Britain and Rose actually drew their plates for Rupsalis dismilis, but it was incorrect and it was Rupsalis Pacheco leonis that they were drawing. So what can happen is that sometimes a person who might be trying to identify their Ripsalis, they may have been looking at the plate pictures. And when they were looking at the plate pictures and they came across this plant, they might have decided that it was Ripsalis dismillis because guess what? It looks just like the plates. And this is for educational purposes. So you see the angles, you know, the very slight angles that they drew. And then you see the subsequent type of you know, the other type of sort of caterpillary growth that is supposed to have many more angles. You see the caterpillary growth there, and then you see this kind of weakly angled growth in these white fruits. Here you can see the correct plate. You know, you see that same, the same angling in the branches there. You see that same kind of caterpillary growth or the multi-angled growth. Here you can see the long angled growth. And here you see this little flower. Like I said, this flower can be kind of pink. It's really cool. And there at the bottom, you see that this was done. This is Rupsalis Pacheco leonis. Well, at the time, the name was a little bit different. It was Pacheco leoni or leonii. Um, and then you see that this plate was attributed to Lofgren. So this one, which I imported, I imported this because I was very, very, very determined to see this plant in person and ensure that this other plant is the same plant. So if you look really closely, you see the angles, you see the resemblance, the strong resemblance there. And the blooms on this, they, everything about it resembles like the, that plate, but the plate was incorrect. Now we get into this one and here's the thing. This plant grows wonky. It grows really weird, which is I think why its popularity, it, why it was less popular. But this one right here, you can see how it kind of looks like Ripsalis dismillis in some ways. Like if we go down here and we see these little rooted cuttings, like there's, I can see the confusion there. When we come in here and we look at this though, see the very, the same very weak angles that we're seeing here. And then this is where we get that secondary type of growth that's coming out. And that can be really confusing because if your plant doesn't have that secondary type of growth, you know, like this one doesn't have that secondary type of growth and it leads me to just continuously saying it can have that kind of growth. But let's look at how beautiful this is. Look at that. Isn't that just so cool? Do we have Rupsalis Pacheco leonis in the United States? I believe so, yes. Is it labeled under the name Rupsalis Pacheco leonis? I don't think so, no. And specifically subspecies Pacheco leonis. In a lot of places you can find it, like I think I purchased this one off of eBay or something. I found it all over eBay. I found it all over Etsy. I just keep finding it under the wrong name. So in terms of a rarity in the United States, the rarity classification, I think we'll go between uncommon and rare. I think the problem is, is that it is in cultivation and there are some private collections that I know of where it is labeled correctly, where it does exist in. And every once in a while, you'll see somebody throw out a picture of the plant. You don't often see the blooms though, but every once in a while, you'll see somebody post pictures of the plant. So you can find pictures of the plant. But in terms of commercial availability, like I wouldn't be able to find it very easily, at least not sold under its correct name. It definitely has to have something more of like an uncommon rare classification because you have to know what name it's being missold as to get it. So hopefully that helps clear up some of the mystery about this plant. Here we have Rupsalis Pacheco leonis, subspecies Catanulata. There are different clones of these. This one I got though, I thought it was a really pretty clone. It's very, 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 uh, the chains are just really, really tight. 
you know, they're, it's really got very tight, prominent kind of chaining on it. Very pretty. I have lots of these and they all look just a little bit different in terms of their chaining. It can depend on how much light you grow it in, etc., cetera, et cetera. Like you can see that this one's kind of a pale green color indicating to me it was grown in a lot of light. This plant is probably just barely rooted. In terms of rarity on this one, we're going to go with uncommon. You can definitely get this plant. You can definitely go in the United States on eBay or Etsy and get it. You can find it from some commercial growers. Uh, like I said, chances are you will find it under the name Rupsalis Pacheco Leonis. And sometimes you will find it under the name Rupsalis Pacheco Leonis subspecies Cadnolata. Next up, we have Rupsalis Pachyptera. So this one also grows in Brazil. Surprise, surprise. This one here you'll often see being tinted purplish, right? And so this can be in varying degrees. So when you put it in the sun, it can turn very, very purple. So this one, I believe I imported from Cactine Hage. I think it was like last year or something. And one of the things that is very easy about this plant is that it has gigantic clades. <laughs> so... One of the things that could definitely help you identify this is a combination of the purplish color and the fact that it has really very large clades in comparison. I always find that the clades have kind of an interesting sort of texture and color. Again, you know, they have this kind of sort of dark grayish green. And when you get that purple in there, it's really interesting. Very easy grower. Um, and... This one, when I had it in the house, I mean, look at how purple that can, the edges of this can get. This one, when I had it in the house, I put it in a south window and these got violently, violently purple. And um, like it almost died from that. And then I moved it away and it, it has kind of come back. I like the way that the new growth comes in. You can see that, you know, they have a lot of lobes on them. They're very pretty. This one here, I think, is just really exceptionally beautiful. You can see all of the beautiful, beautiful lobes on it. You can see it can get three angled growth. Look at how beautiful that growth is. And here you can see just how violently purple this one was getting. There's some abnormal growth there, but you can see how beautiful and dark this one was getting. Look at how beautiful that clade is. So pretty. But one of the interesting things about this is that I did know... You know, and most of these, the coloration on the growth, like I said, when it gets mature, it has a dull color on it, kind of a dull color. And um, so beautiful, though. It's really, really beautiful. In terms of rarity, the rarity classification for this one, I think that we're going to go um, between common and uncommon. I think it is the most common of all of these sort of flat cladded plants. However, I think that it is horrifyingly mislabeled. Uh, I, I have purchased so very many of these that were labeled as Pachyptera and they were something completely different, you know, or other things that were Pachyptera. It's, it's horrible, you know, so Generally, these two I did purchase as Patch of Terra, though, and these two I believe are a Patch of Terra. But yeah, that's generally, I think we would have to go with somewhere between common and uncommon for that reason. Next up is Rupsalis paradoxa, subspecies paradoxa. Uh, also grows in Brazil. <laughs> This is one of the most recognizable Ripsalis. Like, this is truly recognizable. I don't think I have ever seen this sold under a name that was incorrect. I don't think I've ever bought this under an incorrect name. So, yeah, this is just very recognizable Ripsalis. And in terms of rarity classification, this one, I think we would have to go with Common. This is, like I said, super recognizable, not commonly missold, pretty easy if I go, you know, if I went into a Facebook seller group kind of place, if I went on Etsy, if I went on eBay, I could probably find it. I could probably get it from a couple of, 
you know, commercial nurseries, but like more specialized. So yeah, I think we'd have to go with a common classification for Rupsalis paradoxa. Next up is Rupsalis paradoxa subspecies septentrionalis. So this right here is just a little bit crazy because it's crazy. The plant is just crazy. So every time I see this plant, I smile. It is just such a weird, crazy plant. And you know, I think that sometimes the rarity of the plant is not necessarily because it's just more rare. But like I said before, I think sometimes it's because it wasn't as popular. So I think that Ripsalis paradoxa subspecies paradoxa was probably just more popular than Ripsalis paradoxa subspecies septentrionalis because this kid grows weird. <laughs> it just grows like weird. You know, it makes me smile because it's cool and it's interesting and I love seeing that. You know, you can see that the chaining is not quite as prominent. It kind of fans out. It's very interesting. And this one, I've talked about it before. I thought it was comical because I bought it off a lady on eBay. Again, same lady selling super rare Ripsalis that doesn't know she's selling super rare Ripsalis was selling it as a pickle cactus. And she still sells it quite often. And I believe she's also corrected the name since. But in terms of a rarity for this one, um, this one is definitely going to have to go somewhere between uncommon and rare. It's not one that you're going to find very easily. You're not going to find it from a nursery. You would definitely need to either get very lucky and find it from eBay or Etsy, or you would need to do an in-search of to obtain it from a private collection. Next up, Ripsalis pentaptera. So I have kind of a fondness for this one, mostly because I didn't like it at first and then I did. So Ripsalis pentaptera also grows in Brazil five or six ribs it's highly recognizable hard to hard to misidentify this one I think the closest that could really happen with this one is really that uh Ripsalis macranthiform kerbergii they don't really look the same they definitely don't look the same most people would be able to you know figure out Ripsalis pentaptera very easily it's got such a beautiful patterning here See how beautiful that growth is? It's really, really, really pretty. It grows very quickly, despite the appearance that it might not. Like, I think I got this last year, and I think it was started just from, like, these little, little cuttings, and it's all this new growth that it's put on. So it's a pretty fast grower. Really, really a cool plant. In terms of rarity, uh, I believe the classification on this one should go uh, between common and uncommon. I think it veers more on the side of common though. Like, I think that, you know, again, if you were to try to find it eBay, Etsy, Facebook, you can find it commercially from some uh, specialized nurseries. So not too bad. So I think closer to common, but a little uncommon. Next up is Rupsalis pilocarpa. Been growing this one for a while. He's a furry little Rupsalis. He's a kind of a different kind of a cool Ripsalis. Gets like really beautiful berries. Here's kind of the start of a berry. You can see even the berries are kind of furry. Uh, beautiful, beautiful flowers. Great flowers for a Ripsalis. Very different Ripsalis. In terms of rarity for this one, this one we're definitely going to go uh, common. So you can easily find this again, you know, eBay, Etsy, some commercial nurseries. It's one of the more recognizable ones, so it's not often mislabeled. Yeah, so the classification is common. Next up is Rupsalis pitieri. And I talked about this plant before. I really like this plant. It used to be classified under uh, Flocosa. So it used to be Rupsalis flocosa subspecies pitieri, and now it's just moved to its own species. Ripsalis pitieri, and it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful plant. I do know that there is at least one sort of commercial-ish kind of specialized nursery that sells it in the United States. I do feel like I see it a little bit more often. I see it more often than I see Fulcosa. I know that. 
So it's easy to recognize because it has smaller flowers. So in terms of the rarity classification, I feel like this one gets to be somewhere between uncommon and common. And it might be a little bit more on the uncommon side for this one. Here's a definite wish list plant. This one would be Rupsalis pultra. And I'm really not super sure how to say that. So this is a pendant plant. It's got like those sort of cylindrical branches. I would say it probably looks a little bit closer to like your Bassifera. Only it has these really cool pinkish flowers. <laughs> and they are so cool. They're kind of like those bell flowers, you know, kind of like your... Um, your Campos Potorianas, your Bercellis, your Jungaries, your Clavadas, you know, it's kind of, kind of has that vibe to it, only they're pinkish. It's amazing. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, it's one of those things you can tell by what I'm about to say. In terms of its rarity classification, you, I have never seen it for sale in the United States. I have never seen it available from any kind of commercialist nursery. Um, private collections, I don't even know if I've even seen it in private collections. Very hard to even find pictures. Uh, most pictures that I see hail from Europe. So, while, well, it is available in Europe, not so much in the United States. So, rarity classification, I, I think we're going to have to go with Somewhere between rare and your firstborn child. So I don't think it's quite as hard to get as some of the others. So I think we're going to go a little bit more toward rare and a little bit less towards your firstborn child. But it, it's very rare in the United States. Next up is Rupsalis punicio discus. So this has definitely always been one of my favorites for sure. This poor plant, okay, <laughs> imported this darn plant. I think it was last year. I imported it. Most of it died. So I planted like the little twigs that were left. It didn't do anything. And then when it finally rooted and put out like a new little branch over the winter, I was so excited. Came outside this spring, started just sh shooting tons of new growth out. And then this weird, ugly little worm thing decided to eat all of its new growth. And I was like, oh my goodness, I was so sad. And I relocated the little worm and then look at that, it started growing all this new growth again. This is just like, you know, the little plant that could. <laughs> so I now have just an overwhelming fondness for this like tiny little plant. This is the saddest excuse for this plant ever. This plant is gorgeous. Like it gets very, very, it's the one that you see that has like the very dark aerials that it looks like hair. It just gets long, super long, super beautiful. You know, here you can see its new growth that's coming out. You can see, I don't know if you can see them, but the little dark aerials, so beautiful and it'll just keep getting longer and longer. And the only reason why it wasn't doing that here is because these ends were damaged. Like you can see here, that little creep ate the end of this new growth off. So it'll just pick a different point and start growing. And you can see something even ate this one. So what we have learned is that the little caterpillars like to eat this plant. Here you can see these new growth, so fantastic. Very subject to also, you know, getting like a little bit of woodiness on it, subject to like little pieces dying like this kind of thing. I've seen a lot of that kind of stuff. So, you know, again, the flowers also come from underneath the aerial, so it's one that will definitely get kind of scarred. You can see down here at one time, it looks like this bloomed from right there and you can see the little scar that's on it. That's, yeah. So in terms of the rarity here in the United States, rarity classification for this one's pretty hard to get. It's actually harder to get than I think even Hollery is in the US. So I think for classification on this one, we probably need to go with uh, between rare and uncommon, but closer to rare. Yeah, so 
commercially, you won't really find it. So you, there's one nursery that I know of that just recently sort of started trying to sell it. They're never in stock though. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like if you want it, it's not going to, you're not going to find it on eBay or Etsy. It's one of those things where you're definitely going to have to go to, you know, an in search of, it's going to have to come out of a private collection somewhere or import because I imported this from Germany and I have another one that I imported from Germany. So, you know, an import is a way to go, but that still classifies it as being rare. Next up, we have Rupsalis rumbia. Now, this is interesting because Rupsalis rumbia, uh, sometime back had its status kind of stripped, you know, so it wasn't really, it was decided that it wasn't really a species and it was more like a dumping ground for a bunch of other species. More recently, though, they did actually do uh, some genetic testing and they found kind of a stand in replacement or whatever because a lot of people had a plant in their collection that they had called Rupsalis rhombia and turns out they were able to describe it and they were able to discern it so it is a species so is this Rupsalis rhombia I have absolutely no idea what was interesting is that this plant fit the description for Rupsalis rhombia in quite a few different ways uh but i don't know if it is because it also looks very suspiciously like a lot of those plants that i have that are labeled rupsalis oblonga that i don't know if are they are rupsalis oblonga i don't quite know what they are this one just looks a little bit different i don't quite know what's going on <laughs> like one of the things that i know is that it was very typical for rupsalis rhombia to have these a pink margin which this one does um, this one did bloom. You can also see how small these are. These aren't huge, but then the new growth is coming out on this and it is looking kind of different. It's interesting. It's a little bit wavy, it's super cool looking, but you know, it looks like a lot of those other plants that I have that are labeled as Ripsalis oblonga, but the growth on this is very stiff. I just don't know, I have no idea. These are so hard to determine, but I pulled it out because one of the things about Ripsalis rhombia that was very common is that, you know, that pink margin that was all around the um, clades. And some of the pictures that I saw also had this freckling. See how this has this like pinkish freckling? So some of the pictures that I saw in the article, it was the same, but there was also apparently like a green form that had white flowers. I don't know. Like when it gets like that, it's just extra confusing. So in terms of the rarity classification for Rufsalis rhombia, here's the problem with this is I feel like there are now loads of plants out there that have the name Rufsalis rhombia. Are they Rufsalis rhombia? I have absolutely no idea. And I'm guessing neither does anybody else. <laughs> so in terms of that, we kind of have to be like, can I get Ripsalis rhombia and know that it's Ripsalis, Ripsalis rhombia? I think the answer to that question is no. And because of that, in order to get one that was really and true, like it would either have to have been part of that genetic test or we would have to go to a conservatory or a private collection of someone who's been growing for a very long time, a very reputable grower. So because of that, the classification for Ripsalis rhombia, it needs to be rare. Yeah, we'll go with rare for that. Next up is Ripsalis raceli or raceli I. Also from Brazil, the stems can be either flat or three or five angled. This one can get kind of a weird one. Is this Rupsalis Rosselli? I have absolutely no idea because this plant has never bloomed. It's a pretty big plant for never having bloomed. I'm a little concerned about its well-being at this point. <laughs> I, I'm like, hmm. A uh, couple of interesting things about this plant is that it does not turn reddish in the sunlight. And one of the things about Ripsalis rosselli is that it has very large clades. So much like Ripsalis patch of terra, um, 
it it has huge clades, you know, or Oliva vera, which like I said, you're never really going to see, but it has really big clades. So that's something that is important to kind of note about it. This plant, I just don't know what it is. A lot of people have tried to tell me that this plant is Rupsalis patriptera. I gotta be honest with you, it doesn't really look like any plant that I've ever purchased with the name Rupsalis patriptera. The other thing I've noticed about it is that the clades, they're shiny. And they stay shiny for a long time. Check this out though. Put out whatever is going on right here. It's like an actual, like, it may not flower, but its clades grow in like flowers. <laughs> I've never seen that before. That was pretty weird. Uh, yeah, so I don't quite know what's going on with this. Ripsalis Roselli, the thing about it is, is that when it blooms, you can't confuse it with anything else. So, you know, again, like, I, I feel like we go down this weird path where it's like, I can identify something sometimes just on site because of one specific characteristic about the way that it grows. But in some cases, other cases like Ripsalis Roselli, you can't do that really, like unless you have been growing them for a really long time, it might be very difficult to do that kind of thing. So you have to wait for something specific about the plant that can help you identify it. And one of the very specific things about Ripsalis Ripsalli that can help you identify it is the flower. It has a teeny tiny flower. Its flower is way smaller than any of the other ones. And, you know, obviously they grow in like these clusters. So it has these rather large clusters of these little tiny flowers and will produce tons and tons of berries. And so I think that the berries are like a pink, pinkish sort of purplish color. Oh, they're actually, they're more of a reddish purplish sort of color. So that is, yeah, how you would end up identifying that. So is this Rupsalis Rupsalli? I have absolutely no idea. Really and truly, I don't. So in terms of the rarity classification on that, Rupsalis Rupsalli is rare. Uh, I feel like you could go out and you could maybe find something that is sold under that name and purchase it, and then it won't be Rupsalis Rupsalli. So I, I think that this is one where you definitely need to go to more of a private collector, someone who has definitely had it bloom, who can confirm the little tiny blooms, who can confirm the berry color. I think that's the only surefire way to get this species. So definitely classified as rare. Next up is Rupsalis Schaeferi. This used to be classified as Rupsalis bassifera, subspecies Schaeferi, and that should tell you a few things about it. This one grows in Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, and Paraguay. So seems to be pretty prolific. It is not, however, all that prolific in cultivation. <laughs> I think one of the reasons why is because, again, at one time it was a bassifera. It's a little bit confusing. You know, do we have it in our collections? Probably, probably. I imported this one. I don't even know if it's the right one yet. We'll see, you know, when it blooms and when it fruits and everything, because that's pretty much how you're going to tell it apart from anything else. It's going to have to bloom. It's going to have to fruit. Um... <laughs> So it's supposed to have shorter and stiffer stems. Uh, the fruit is supposed to be white or pink, which really doesn't help anything, and the flowers are supposed to be white. So in terms of rarity classification, once again, because I feel like it's going to be real hard to even get this plant, mostly because of identification issues, uh, you'd have to import it or get it from a collection that somebody definitely knew what they had. So I think we would have to classify this one probably as rare. Yep. Yeah. I think the classification on this one needs to be rare. Next up is Rupsalis sulcata. So you will see that I have a ridiculous amount of plants on the table here. And I think that this plant is one that is really interesting because it really helps understand just how messed up identification for a plant can actually get. So I have seen this plant over here. I bought this plant from a really reputable source under the name Ripsalis sulcata. I have seen this plant, and let me actually grab these. There you go, especially so you can get an idea 
I guess, about, you know, kind of how big they are and stuff. I've also seen this plant for sale as Rupsalis sulcata. I have seen this plant for sale as Rupsalis sulcata. This one's important to get a good idea, I guess, about kind of how big these are and some of the characteristics about this. And I have seen this plant for sale as Rupsalis sulcata. Here comes the question of what exactly is going on with Rupsalis sulcata. So I decided that because I was highly confused about this, I decided to go all the way back to or the leading publication for Rupsalis identification. It would have been the New Cactus Lexicon. And the New Cactus Lexicon is no longer in print, but it was printed, it was a two volume kind of set. One volume had the illustrations and the other volume had the descriptions. Now, a lot of the information that you find on ripsalis.com, not all of it, but some of it definitely came out of this publication. So I wanna take a moment to look at what the description was for Ripsalis sulcata from this publication. Now, be very careful about the idea of doing that because sometimes years later it has been proven wrong, you know, that these publications were wrong, etc., etc. But this I don't believe is the case here because it's an issue with looking just at one source for information versus a lot of different sources. And I have looked at a lot of different sources for this one, but I think this is really interesting because this particular plant was not found in the wild. It was literally only known out of a private collection. So that's really interesting one. So the second thing about this is, is that it says in the description that the segments or the plant overall kind of has the appearance of Ripsalis serioides, but overall the plant is pendant. It goes on to say that the basal branch segments are 8 to 10 millimeters in diameter. Now, 8 to 10 millimeters in diameter, we're going to get real nerdy here for a second. 8 to 10 millimeters in diameter is somewhere between there and right there. After that, it goes on to say that the new segments are arising 2 to 5 together. So it's trying to say that like a new, you know, the new growth, like here, for example, on Ripsalis fulcosa, we have the branch segment and then we have the new branches coming out and they're coming out, five of them are coming out together. But this is saying that they're going to come out two to five together. And then it goes on to say that the branches are less than 25 centimeters long. So less than 25 centimeters 25 centimeters is this. 25 centimeters is quite long, but it's saying that they're less than that. So we can make the kind of assumption here that they could potentially get up to 25 centimeters long, which is really interesting. And then it goes on to say that the branches for, you know, not the basal ones, but like the ones that are arising out are six to seven millimeters in diameter. That is six millimeters. That is seven. That is very small. That is not very big. So the diameter is really kind of, it's narrow. And then it goes on to say that the branches, it doesn't say which branches, which leads me to believe all of them are weakly three to five angled. So like here where you see Ripsalis pentaptera, these are usually five angled, right? So that gives you an idea of what it's talking about there. And then it goes on to say that the shortest branches are sometimes almost round. And then it says that it's the aerials are naked prior to flowering, except for a minute scale and occasionally has bristles. The scale is supposed to be raised and the flower, the flower on this plant is supposed to be 1.5 centimeters in diameter. 
Now 1.5 centimeters in diameter is about this. So that's, that's not a small flower. And then it goes on to say somewhat resembling Ripsalis flocosa, but with consistently angled branch segments and less obviously erumpent flowers, leaving only slightly woolly aerials after it has flowered. So that's what it's saying about this plant. Now, having read that description, I gotta be honest with you, there really isn't much on this table that is matching that description, save perhaps this plant, but we're gonna get to that. So I wanna go back and take a look at their description for Ripsalis ewaldiana, because it's interesting what the difference is about the way that it's describing these two plants. So with Ripsalis ewaldiana, right off the bat, it's saying the branches are dimorphic. And what that means is, is that there are two distinct types of growth when you're looking at it, some of the branches will look one way and some of the other branches will look a different way. And then it goes on to say that the growth of the primary branches is indeterminate. So that means that you might have some very, very long primary branches coming out. And primary branches, like, you know, obviously, let's grab this one because this is this is a good example because these ones are pretty long here. So primary branches, you know, kind of being like this, they're indeterminate. So you can see how long these darn branches are getting. And then it goes on to say that the branches are four angled and they are less than 60 centimeters long and about four to five millimeters in diameter. And then it goes on to talk about lateral branches. Lateral branches, it's saying, are determinate, meaning that they do have a set length, and they're supposed to be in between three to six centimeters, and they're mostly three-angled. Mostly. And it goes on to say that the flowers, it blooms laterally, which means it doesn't bloom at the ends, it blooms down the sides of the segments. And it says it has a reddish bud. Now the flower diameter is interesting because it is 1.4 to 2 centimeters in diameter. So Ripsalis ewaldiana has a fairly large flower. It's generally white. There are three plants on this table that match that description, but they all look just a little bit different. So here is what I kind of think happened. And again, this is what I'm about to say is totally subject to my own personal opinion about having looked through this much information. Now, my own personal opinion on this is, is that that plant, this one right here, is Ewaldiana. That plant that I bought under the name Ripsella silicata is also Ewaldiana. That plant that I probably bought under the name Ripsalis ewaldiana, I could have got it as Silcata, I also could have got it as Strigona, is also ewaldiana. So, I have a picture of what this plant is supposed to look like because they had illustrations in this book. There is no way that in this book they would have taken such a poor, poor picture of this plant in a way that would make it confusing as to what the segments looked like. And I have seen pictures of this plant in more than one publication. This one, which I am commonly now seeing sold under the name Ripsalis silcata. There's another piece of information out there, I think I found it on ripsalis.com, noting that Ripsalis silcata could quite commonly be confused with Ripsalis macrantha doesn't really say which form, but they were going after form Kerbergii mostly. So Kerbergii having a kind of appearance that looks kind of like Pentaptera. It is pendant. Now the big difference there being is that this plant, it has small flowers, right? It, it resembles Pentaptera sometimes. You know, it has the appropriate segments and stuff. They're not quite the appropriate length. I think that what you're gonna find is that Ripsalis silcata probably resembles this plant. Based off of the descriptions there, it probably has thinner sort of segments, 
kind of like Rupsalis flocosa. It's going to kind of look like that. Sometimes they might be sort of roundish, but mostly they're going to have a very consistent sort of angling pattern. And Rupsalis flocosa grows very long and very dangly. So not a single one of these plants on this table do I believe is Rupsalis sulcata. I don't believe I have Rupsalis sulcata in my collection. I believe if I wanted Rupsalis sulcata, I would probably have to import it from somewhere. It's possible that somewhere in the United States, a few people have this plant in their collection. I'm also going to say that this is one of these ways in which I was really confused for a very long time about this. And because I purchased this from a, review, a reputable source, I believed that it was Rupsalis sulcata until I started looking closer. In terms of the rarity classification, I'm really going to have to go with rare. I'm not really going to go all the way to like your firstborn child, but I'm going to go to rare on this one. I'm going to go to rare on this one because I think that we probably have it in some of our collections, but we don't know that we have it. We probably have a plant in our collections that's like, what is that? I don't know. So, yeah. It is also supposed to be, I will say too, that I also read that it is supposed to be very related to Ripsalis pentaptera. Next up, we have Ripsalis terris form terris. Now, this plant is interesting because if I went out and I tried to find Ripsalis terris, chances are I would get any other form but terris. <laughs> So this is a really strange thing where I think that the other forms just sort of took over in a way that is very crazy because most people didn't even seem to know that there was a form terrace. So of course there is. <laughs> you, you're always going to have the standard form. So even though we have three other forms underneath the species, we still have the standard form terrace. So... This I had to import, which is a little bit crazy. So I had to import this because there, even though maybe I could have found it in the United States, I don't know how I would have ever determined that. So unfortunately, this guy is a little bit juvenile here, but you can see, I mean, how totally cool is this growing, right? So, you know, eventually it's going to shoot out. It's like this was probably a cutting from like one of those big, long, big, long uh, sort of things. So it might be a little bit atypical of the growth here, but you can also see that it's it's pendant, you know, and I've seen other pictures of this like that, too, where it's definitely pendant and shoots out those big, long branches and then it gets the whorls and it just gets very pendant and very interesting. So if you were ever curious, what does Rupsalis terrace form terrace look like, looks a little bit more like this. So the classification on this one, because of the unfortunate issue with this, and because I think it's probably one that is very confused for like the Rupsalis bassiferas of the world, I, I very strongly doubt whether a person would get this and classify it as a terrace just by seeing this. I know I would have. If I just saw this, I would not have thought it was a terrace. I would have thought it was a bassifera. So um, in terms of that, in terms of me knowing, hands down, I couldn't find it, knowing that you would have to get it from a very reputable source that got it from a very reputable source, or you'd have to get it directly from a um, conservatory, uh, yeah, I would definitely have to say the classification for Rupsalis terris form terris is rare. Next up is Rupsalis terris form capilliformis. Now, this plant, I had been trying and trying and trying for a very long time to find the species Rupsalis terris form capilliformis. I have purchased so many plants that were labeled as capilliformis. And to have them just be so wildly incorrect. This plant, I was moseying around on, I think it was Etsy. And I saw someone selling this plant and they didn't know what it was. It was just an unknown. And I picked it up and I was like, ooh, this is really interesting. Because this is what I would think Ripsalis terris form capilliformis would look like. If, if I saw it, you know, I've seen... Other kinds of crazy pictures of something where, 
yeah, I've seen some crazy pictures, but you know, I've also done a lot of research, I guess, with looking at pictures in the wild and everything. And I waited for this thing to bloom. And then whenever it bloomed and I saw the bloom, it was definitely a terrace bloom. And then waiting for it, the bloom to basically like fade and watching it turn bright yellow. So there is no doubt in my mind that this is a Rupsalis terrace. And because of the growth and because you can see how thin the growth is here, I would definitely say that this plant fits into the A classification of Rupsalis terrace form, Capilliformis. You can see just how thin and delicate these are. They are very thin and very delicate. And look at its little growth with its little whirl and just how delicate those are. So very interesting. One of the things that I noticed about this and a lot of the things that I saw in the wild pictures of this were the little red clay, the little red um, scales. So here you can see those little red scales and it took me forever to find this and let alone to have to find it under an unknown name. So I have seen Rupsalis clavata form Delicatula sold as Rupsalis capilliformis. I have seen many variations of your like Ripsalis burchellis or your Ripsalis campus portoranas also sold as Ripsalis terrace form capilliformis. I have seen different varying forms of uh, Ripsalis bassifera or different subspecies of Ripsalis bassifera also sold as Ripsalis capilliformis. So really, really hard to get a hold of this plant. So therefore, I would say that the rarity classification on this one, it is going to have to be classified as rare, simply because if you had it, you probably might not know that you had it. Uh, you'd have to wait for it to bloom to confirm it. And chances are you're going to kiss a whole lot of frogs before you kiss that prince on this one. And here we have Rupsalis terrace form heterocleta. And here is a plant that knows how to grow. <laughs> this plant definitely knows how to grow. And it's just kind of this funny like bush plant that will eventually get pendant and cascade. Very fast growing plant. Most of the terras are very, very fast growing. So in terms of rarity classification on this one, this one is a whole lot more recognizable than the other ones. It is not so commonly mislabeled. The flower is very recognizable and it's pretty easy to get. You can go on eBay, go on Etsy, not a hard plant to get and it's usually sold under the correct name. So the rarity classification on this one, I think, um, I think we'll go common to uncommon, but I think we're leaning more towards common. Next up, we have Rupsalis terrace form prismatica. Very easy to recognize plant because it has these sort of angled, angled segments here. This can have varying kind of, uh, varying growth habit. I've got one of these that is just absolutely bananas. It is so tall. It is taller than I am at this point because it shoots off those big long branches and it just grows like a maniac out of those. So this looks all small and cute and everything, but it, it turns into a giant monster. So in terms of rarity classification on this one, this one is big box store common. This is one of those ones in the United States that you will find in a commercial setting. So you'll find it in like your Home Depots. You'll find it in your Lowe's. You know, you'll find it generally, generally it'll be like one of those you know, succulents, like a two inch or four inch succulent kind of thing. I don't think they usually put the names on these. You, you see that a lot again in the Facebook groups and stuff, people coming in and being like, oh, what is this plant? I think it's a Rupsalis, you know? Yeah. So Rupsalis terrace form prismatica. And I do kind of want to land on the note with the Rupsalis terrace, um, all the different forms, because I talked about it before with one of the other ones with the Macrantha. The, the thing is, is that these are the forms that are recognizable. Like these are ones that we could cluster and, and give them names because they were recognizable forms. That doesn't mean that there aren't plants 
in terrace that are kind of anomalous or, you know, grow in a little bit of a different region, but there just aren't enough or aren't super recognizable enough to give them forms or even intermediate forms in between them. Next up, let's look at Rupsalis triangularis. Now, Rupsalis triangularis uh, is one that I believe is a little more epilithic. So I think it's one that's going to be kind of growing on rocks. Should tell us a little bit about it, that generally it likes a much faster draining sort of substrate holds on to water a little bit more. You can see the deep ribs in it. It's kind of a funny thing because the name triangularis, but honestly the wings or the ribs can be all the way up to, I believe, five angled on this one. And it does bear a kind of striking resemblance to Aguduensis, but it does in person look a little bit different. Uh, these have a tendency to be very, the lobes have a tendency to be pretty sharp. Rarity classification for this one, I feel like this is another one that is really more along the lines of subject to popularity. So I don't really think that this one is super rare. I think that it wasn't as popular as a lot of the other Rupsalis. And it's beautiful Rupsalis. Really and truly, it's quite beautiful. Like if you look at pictures of the flowers and stuff, it's gorgeous. But given that and I know that I can go online and I know that I can find it. So I've seen it on eBay. I've seen it on Etsy. I know that you could probably import it. I, I purchased this in the United States from either eBay or Etsy. And while I think it's a little bit more difficult to get, I think that the classification on this one is probably uncommon. It might be uncommon to rare, but it's still more on the uncommon side. And next up, we have Rupsalis trigona. So... <laughs> Trigona is an interesting one. So I think that uh, it took me a few years to get Rupsalis trigona. And here's the thing about Rupsalis trigona. Every single plant that I saw sold as Rupsalis trigona, I purchased, whether that was from the United States or I was importing it. Every single last one. And do you know how many of them were correct? Zero. None of them were correct. I have purchased uh, several different forms of Macrantha um, because Macrantha can have a lot of variability and it can sometimes grow kind of three angled. And the, I've, I've purchased that multiple times and had that, you know, had it happen that it was incorrect. I have purchased uh, Ripsalis serioides as Trigona, that one I imported. And for a long time, I was kind of scratching my head over what that plant was. Um, but then I was like, oh, the berries. <laughs> so it was just a very desiccated serioides. So that's kind of the problem with this plant. Plus, it can be very, very, very confused with some forms of Ripsalis dismillis form in the United States that they used to call Mary Arianum or Mary Ariana. <sighs> So in order for me to get this plant, I had to do a bunch of searching and find a private collector who I know sells plants and had this in their collection at some point. Now, mind you, this was like a kind of a Facebook investigation thing. And it was years back that I saw that this one particular person had sold cuttings of this at one time. And um, that's how I ended up obtaining the plant. But, you know, given that the rarity classification on this one, it definitely has to sit in rare. If you have not seen your Ripsalis in any of these videos, there's a potential that your Ripsalis is under an old name. And I highly suggest you go to ripsalis.com and look at that name to probably get its new name. Also, there are some really weird made-up names out there, and there are some places that have been distributing them um, based off of where their locale is. Sometimes people will take that as being the correct name when it's really just where it was found. Uh, Ripsalis hybrids, it's kind of a thing because I don't really think that there is a whole lot of Ripsalis hybrids out there in existence. But there is one that is commonly sort of distributed in Europe, and I don't know how valid it is because I don't have it and I've never really seen it. I know that there is a plant that is sold an awful lot in Europe that's called Ripsalis Heidelberg. 
Honestly, when we see pictures of it, it just looks like Ripsalis punicio discus. Ripsalis punicio discus, it should have orange fruit. And this hybrid that's out there should have purple fruit or kind of pinkish purple fruit. I am by no means an expert at all. So there is information that I have possibly provided here that is incorrect. Just recently, the Ripsalis sulcata things shocked me because I was so sure that plant was Ripsalis sulcata because I had never looked closer at it until doing this video. Not every Ripsalis that you will find or have in your collection will fit into any description. They have a lot of plants that don't fit any ID. Ribsalis was not a genus that was too terribly studied. <laughs> so it's also something where, you know, just like we went over there, there was like some plants that we didn't even know existed. And just all of a sudden it's like, boom, we've discovered like a bunch of new Ribsalis. So they're in like isolated forest, you know, cloud forest areas generally, not always, but generally in places like Brazil. Some of those places are really hard to get to. You know, I really want to thank, I think the people who commented on the last video, I want to thank you for letting me know that the videos are useful to you. I really want to thank the subscriber, and I know this is kind of a rough thing, but I want to thank the subscriber who said that they were now questioning the identity of all of their Ripsalis. And I'm thankful for that, even though I know that's a rough spot to be, but because the main purpose of doing these videos has more to do with just getting information out there about these plants. There's not a lot of information, as well as I think I want people to be excited about them. I also want people to be able to at least attempt to be able to collect the right plant. I think that when I see comments like that, I, I at least know that I'm helping in some way. And I really just want to say thank you. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for watching and happy cacti growing.